Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, once again, thanks everyone for joining. We're very excited to have our first Connected Car series webinar kicking off today. And I'd like to start by introducing and thanking our speakers. Um, first, we will have Andreas Straczynski, who is Head of Region Germany and Head of Global Automotive Sales for Telenor Connection. Then we will have Christoph Helmus, who is Vice President of Platforms, of the Platforms Office for HERE. And David Jumpa, who is the Chief Revenue Officer for Airbiquity. And I am Claudia Bacco, Managing Director for EMEA for our CR Wireless News. Well, Connected Car is really a very exciting industry. There's a huge amount of growth, and I really believe this is one of the areas that there's the potential for so much disruption over the next 12 to 18 months that there'll be a lot to watch. That said, there's also a lot of challenges that need to be resolved in this industry, um, not the least of which uh, defining what a connected car is. Um, there are so many different understandings about this topic, not only within the end users, but also within the players in the industry that a lot of them describe themselves in many different ways. I mentioned the end users, and that's another key topic. Who owns the end user? Because everyone wants to own the end user relationship. The automotive OEM, the uh, telematics service provider, the mobile network operator, um, Google, Apple, uh, a lot to be sorted out there. Data privacy is another key topic. Uh, how do you ensure the data that is being transmitted to and from the vehicle is safe? Uh, not only your personal data, but also the diagnostic data of the car. And then there's the security of the car. As the cars become more connected and we implement more technologies, uh, IT technologies such as Ethernet in the car, there's more opportunities for challenges. The discussion around telecom technologies and how we will connect to the car, will it be Wi-Fi? Uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, LTE. And then lastly, how does regulation play in all this? Because there are some very specific rules in some countries about how this uh, needs to be done. And, um, and then in others, it, there's a lot more options. So when I look at the connected car industry, and I really hope that you'll all download the companion report to go with this uh, webinar that'll be available first thing tomorrow. Um, U.S. Central Time, uh, I really think that it's really the mix of the right and the left brain together. So you have all the emotion of the excitement of driving a car and all of the interesting content that you can download, and then the logic of am I safe, is my car safe, is my content safe, and how does that all come together in an integrated experience. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Andrea, who is our first presenter. And our three presenters today are going to help us consider and solve some of these topics. Andrea? Yeah, hello all together. Um, thanks for the nice introduction. And I think it's a very um, interesting topic there. As um, just briefly introducing for them who don't know us, um, I'm from Telenor Connections. And we are supporting the connected car industry already since the late 90s, where we pioneered on the M2M -M area from the Telenor Group to connecting customers like for Volvo, Volvo Group. So uh, one of our biggest connectivity area we are in the automotive, either it's the car OEMs, it's the truck OEMs, or any service provider around that, like insurance, telematic, and all that stuff there. So in between that, we see the involvement from M to M going to IoT, and that also is something that everything around the car gets more and more connected. And we see therefore um, the the need and the having discussions with the car OEM, how then the car are fitting into that ecosystem, and what are the good solutions for that to um, move forward. Um, we are just focused on connecting the things and supporting that as an infrastructure to ease that for everybody who want to connect things. So um, you just go ahead then with the presentation. That, that's just a brief overview what is currently the way or the world looking on connecting things. 
and it will go more and more. Um, so at one point, and especially if you look over Asia and all the things, it's more or less that everything around you is connected, either by a phone, either machine, and that is totally, I would say, the new thing how it is. It is a commodity for everybody that you expect your surroundings to be connected to ease your life. So if you look then, what would that mean for a car on the next one? That is actually also that um, I think now it starts to be time that the car manufacturer think out of their silo solutions, which are currently there. If you look at the different areas, definitely U.S. is the, um, and maybe some Asian other ones who are leading that nearly every car is somehow connected. But every car manufacturer has their own silo solutions, and they don't cooperate to each other, and also that makes it a little bit difficult to open these systems for the surroundings and how to interact between that. So um, we try to work with them um, also to think a little bit more out of the silo solution and uh, looking how the car can be part of that huge connected ecosystem. So everybody has the benefit and of the multiple use of it. Is it not convenient that I come home and my garage door is open automatically. Is it not convenient I come out of a shopping mall and maybe my uh, back door is open automatically because I'm coming there? That does not mean that everything needs to be connected by um, wireless carrier like uh, GSM or LTE and all that stuff. This is also opening the solution for other technologies to come. That's what we see. And that's why we, as a um, connected service provider, um, have opened also our infrastructure to not just work with our customers and partners on connecting via a wireless uh, 3G or 2G or whatever solution, but you need to be open also to new technologies around that. Um, so you really can see the benefit, and the customers in general or the drivers, they are more open to it. I, there is the concern of how and what data to be shared, but if there is a benefit to your direct drivers and my surrounding around that, and I maybe also think of how this can be steered in a big ecosystem like in Europe, where you have then um, the um, uh, sustainability coming around, and maybe you're not allowed a certain car to drive in every city, um, the communication between car to car and car to infrastructure um, is definitely something to look in this open solution because the car manufacturers and everybody surrounding must find a space and find a solution to support that. So if you look at the, the next one, it is, it is definitely there that there is the issue on that uh, everything getting connected to different needs. So the need on having it connected either by really also easy connectivity. I come there and have uh, Bluetooth in Bluetooth to energy connection to, for example, have uh, the phone being the key why I need another key for open my car. Or I can interact via other communication with a smart home. So um, the infrastructure to connect a car must be much more open and much more broader thinking. Because this car, whatever it's produced now, they will be out in the market for several years. And you still want to have a benefit and not an outdated car one day after you bought it. So there are where you have to, to really find a solution which makes absolutely sense. And um, then and the next one, which is also crucial, and where we see as um, a connectivity provider, the need also to be um, flexible on that, and we get the request on, from the car OEMs on that, is 
how do you um, support that on the business model side? Sorry on that, that was um, So um, from the business model side, obviously, there is the classical model for the, let me call it gray color services, the safety, security, maybe remote access where you have the classical, I would say, telco operators having a contact with the car manufacturers around that service, and these services are either included in the car price, equipment, or warranties around that. But in a new open system where also the customer or the driver itself bring in the communication module, or you want to have an open ecosystem where for some services this third party eco provider, like a content provider or something like that, want to participate in, also the usage of the data you need in that must be flexible and having business models flexibility and uh, list of the build possibilities so that everybody can share that and not the car OEM sitting on all the data which are used. Um, in Europe particular, you have the issue of the roaming, the multiple networks and the ecosystem quite complex. Um, so um, the driver most likely don't have the phone contract from the company who provided the connectivity inside the car. So of bounding them together is nearly impossible if you want to talk to all the MNOs here in Europe to get agreement on interfaces between that. Um, and still, if you compare the amount of cars compared to the amount of mobile operators, it's still a uh, mobile network um, customers, there's still a minority around that. So um, the flexibility on the technology um, that means on the openness for the system and the flexible of the business model um, will be key to um, be successful and also to make it attractive enough for end consumers and an open ecosystem to be part of it and want to be part of it. And finally, on the last slide, what is absolutely key and never forget is the enter and security. You mentioned that, Claudia, that um, it's more and more open and it's also more and more dangerous. And it's this communication way in which data are stored in a cloud solution that must be very cautiously looked, as you said, on regulation, what is possible, what is the acceptance rate in the, at the customer. But we believe if the customer sees enough the benefit, they will accept that. There are legal hurdles which can't be just gifts and the security aspect of the way of communication where we can take them, we take it very serious. Not just GSM connectivity, which is somehow um, encrypted, but we put on another layer for encryption to make it really end-to-end -end insured and to make it end-to-end -end insured between the car and the back end, but as well on all the other players in between so that every communication has happened there. We're staying out of the car bus system itself, but this is a crucial system as well. So we want to ensure that nothing can hit the car, um, so something bad could happen at the bus system later on. That's how we see it, and also the discussion we have with the car OEMs going further. They're a bit afraid of um, the new thing and the openness. They are, we get requests from their drivers, and they see also the benefit of but how to handle it, and especially how to handle it in a product which is out on the market at least for 10 years, which is different than if you're con talking about connected toothbrushes on consumer side. Um, they are not maybe lasting 10 years, I hope. I don't use my toothbrush 10 years. So um, that's much more agile on that. To bring these ecosystems together is key, plus the ecosystem of the cities the ecosystem of different um, government regulations. It's complex, but it's also exciting to work with that. And now where acceptance um, and awareness of the people are there, I think it's now really the moment where everybody can participate when we have an open um, talk and an open system around that, which is ensured to connect everything in a safe way. 
great. Thank you, Andrea. I'm going to um, hand it off to Christoph, but first I want to make a comment as some questions are coming in that we'll hold the questions until the end, and then we'll ask the questions to the panelists appropriately. So I will go ahead and switch to Christoph's first slide. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, my name is Christoph Helmes. Uh, I'm from here. Uh, thanks for having us in this, uh, in this webinar. Um, here is a Nokia company, and uh, we are what we call a location intelligence company. Uh, we have been pioneers of digital mapping more than 25 years ago, where we brought the first incarnation of a digital map to the vehicle, which enabled a fantastic, useful and new experience called navigation in a car. Uh, meanwhile, we have moved on and combined this highly fresh and accurate maps which we do on a global basis uh, with location and cloud intelligence because through connectivity a lot of new use cases are being able and in particular in the car. So while we have, as being from the Nokia side, we have experienced a revolution nearly seven, eight years ago called the smartphone which brought connectivity in the internet into the consumer's hands, I think we're at the advent uh, in the automotive industry to see a similar revolution. And today you can see it on the slide already 25, uh, tw sorry, 23 million cars are connected on the internet. But if you move on please to the next slide, this is about to explode uh, to something. And you know, depending on which numbers you believe, uh, we will see that by 2020 it will be 152 million cars, maybe even more. I think the message here is through this connectivity, and we heard before what some of the challenges and opportunities are, there will, is a massive opportunity to create new services, new experiences uh, for what is called the connected car. Now on the next slide, if we move on, what are we doing to make this, this revolution um, happening? We as here focus essentially on four core elements that, that are part of the vehicle. Uh, and you can see them on this on this graphics. Of course, it is the map itself and related what we call automotive services, providing fuel prices, up-to-date weather information, traffic information, and so on. That's pretty much what most of us know when, when uh, driving a modern vehicle by now. But you know, we're at the advent to move to the next step, something which we call smart guidance. So whereas today everybody pretty much most of the time gets the same route because it's a pretty standard behavior that that we expect. You will get your personalized experience, your smart guidance in the car. Some people prefer to drive more highways, some people like prefer more scenic routes or others. So it's a very individual behavior that the driver prefers to have. Making guidance smart and as we say contextual. This is what we're working a lot with the automotive industry. But it's not only about the driver, it is also about the car itself, which will start to become pretty intelligent. And the big topic that probably most of the viewers and, and listeners are aware is what is called the autonomous vehicle. In other words, the vehicle starts to drive on its own or supports you while you drive in certain situations. That's truly a next revolution for the whole automotive industry, making the car that intelligent and smart that it can find its way from A to B, that it can drive on its own, that it can support the driver. And this opens up a whole new range of benefits to consumers of connected vehicle. It will make driving smarter, but also much more safer. And you may have heard that certain automotive OEMs in the industry state that by whatever 2020 or 2030, they expect no more or zero casualties because the cars become smart they start to communicate with each other and with their environment. So that's about the intelligent car. But lastly, I think there is something that goes even beyond the car, which is what we call the digital transportation infrastructure, where a lot of players in the industry, cities, network operators, uh, municipalities play a role. We want to become smart how we handle mobility and traffic uh, in the increasingly growing urban society. Uh, what makes sense so that people take the right road or the right route that optimizes traffic and reduces maybe air pollution or makes best use of available 
parking spots and parking places, including multiple means of transportation, maybe public transportation or individual transportation or something new, what is called para paratransit. So all these new elements start to come together and obviously at the center, and this is where we work with automotive OEMs, tier one supplier, is the intelligent vehicle where, you know, the users will have a similar revolution like we saw in the mobile phone industry roughly seven or eight years ago. And at the heart, and this is the, the last slide that I have to show to give a little bit of visual impression um, uh, to the viewers and, and uh, of, of this webinar, this is a map, and this is the next generation map. Uh, we all know maps uh, from the past. They're very often colored lines on a piece of paper, flat 2D, but they're different maps for subway, for biking, for walking, for driving. But what we see here is the next generation map, which we're all building, very expensive. Uh, but the map will be three-dimensional and it will be highly precise. Because in order to make a lot of these scenarios happen, in particular the one about autonomous or assisted driving, the map needs to be centimeter precise. It needs to be super precise so the car knows in which lane it is, uh, what's the way to drive. And whereas a car with its multiple sensors, cameras and, and radar and LiDAR sensors will be able to, to scan and look what is around, the map essentially enables the car to look behind the corner uh, over the bend and with a lot of dynamic real-time information about other vehicles be able to find the best way and assure safety um, economically but also fun while driving. So this is what the revolution happening in the location industry, the next generation of map that enables these novel use cases but I think we as, as consumers and users of cars are really at the end of having a fantastic exciting uh, next decade coming up where car will offer novel services unmatched and unseen in the past and that's what we're very happy to work with our customers and partners. Great, thank you Christoph. Uh, now I'm going to hand it off to David. Let me get to your first slide. Thank you. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Ubiquity. Um, I'm David Jampa. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer for Ubiquity. I lead all the global sales, marketing, and uh, program management initiatives for the company. Uh, Ubiquity has actually been around now since 1997, uh, mostly as a technology company, developing different components or, or software uh, widgets, I would say, for automotive as well as for telecom. Uh, it, as you can see from the number of patents we have in, the, in our portfolio, uh, we really a, a big part of our focus has been in the communication uh, and technology aspect and how to uh, bring information in and out of the vehicle. Uh, uh, you know, there are several products of that. One is our AQ-Link product, which is our data over voice modem, and then now we've moved more into the B2X uh, uh, to cloud services to the vehicle and then providing some of the content services. Um, we, we have service today in 50 countries. Uh, we have commercial customers that are actually uh, have vehicles that we're monitoring, everything from electric vehicles to uh, smartphone integration to safety and security related programs. And then we've also localized a lot of those services based on languages and then also just content in, uh, in general. Um, I, I would say that we're, we're a very, and as you'll see from the next slide, if we can go to the next slide, we're a trusted partner in this space. Uh, we have handled management um, uh, services for, uh, for quite a bit of OEMs and suppliers. Uh, you know, our headquarters is here in Seattle. We have our, our European headquarters in London, uh, an office as well as in, in uh, uh, Shanghai, uh, and a development office as well in, in, in China. Um, if we can go to the uh, next slide. Let's see here. Okay, so here, here's, as you, as you can see from our company's evolution, uh, it kind of mirrors a little bit what the evolution that you're starting to see with the, with the connected vehicle on a global scale. So a big part of our, our services between 97 and 2006 was around developing technology or, or widgets, licensing that software to uh, uh, the OEMs as well as some of their tier ones. And then we started seeing a transition uh, within the car companies. We saw the transition to go into more of a cloud service where they needed a, a framework to be able to provide different types of services for different types of vehicles. So today we're talking a lot about the consumer aspect of it, but a lot of the OEMs are also have to deal with their fleet uh, uh, sector with very specific verticalized uh, vehicles like uh, electric vehicles or electric vehicles for commercial use. And as you can see the evolution of Airbiquity, we've developed technology and services um, for a lot of these uh, different OEMs 
as well as some of the wireless carriers and partnering with them. One of our, our uh, suppliers and partners as well as Telenor was on the, on the phone. We've also worked with here as part of the uh, uh, other uh, uh, programs as well for smartphone integration. And the, the big part of, you know, one of the, I, I've heard a, a couple things from uh, my fellow presenters that the connected car is going to continue to grow. And I would, you know, one thing I would say is that it has, it is continuing to grow, but there is one thing that keeps coming into the vehicle with the latest and greatest technology and quite a bit of amount of content, which is your smartphone, right? And that's been a big part of Airbiquity's focus, the infotainment area for the last uh, few years. And we, we are finding that there's this, this hybrid model that is actually coming together. Um, can, we, can we go to the next slide? And I'll show you, I'll show you the components I, I think that you would need to in, in bringing these solutions together. So from, uh, if you look at, at a high level, these are all the major components uh, that a, a OEM will need. Or if you're a supplier on the call and listening, you will need to work and fit within these type of of, of the supply chain that, that exists today. Uh, you know, either working with the vehicle head unit providers, uh, working in, in or, the, or some of the um, TCU service providers uh, that, that are out there, and then also working with some of the mobile network uh, service provider. And then from an Airbiquity perspective, we're actually more on the, on the service delivery aspect. We're trying to manage all the platform and plumbing that is required to provide these services reliably for our, our OEM customers and, and working within this ecosystem. So there's the back office integration for OEM specific data that needs to be used. Uh, there's uh, OEM management on how to help them manage their customers. And not necessarily that one supplier is actually bringing this whole solution together. There's one component that actually is managing the vehicle side as well as the application layer uh, aspect of it for uh, driver management services as well. Uh, or as uh, uh, was just said the last presentation, the intelligent vehicle uh, uh, aspect of it. You can go to the next slide. So we talked a little bit about ecosystem integration, and we I truly believe uh, that that is the only way we're going to be successful, and not only successful in launching services, but meeting the the uh, uh, the price points that uh, need to be in place for this to become a standard. Uh, across the board. Uh, there's different things that are happening in this evolution of the connected vehicle. In Europe, there's an e-call initiative, uh, crash notification initiative, which is going to demand that every vehicle have an embedded uh, SIM or embedded wireless device for monitoring for crash services. In the United States, that's being driven more for competitive reasons. Everyone reacted to General Motors OnStar, um, uh, and then following from that, uh, everyone's reacted to Ford Sync's initiative uh, that bringing a smartphone or a feature point into the vehicle to bring the content with you to provide these services. So between these two different devices that are coming or are or coming into the vehicle, uh, there is an entire ecosystem that needs to be pulled together uh, for the car manufacturers. In some cases, they're bringing some of their partners. In other cases, we're bringing them and so forth. And I think what you, what you see from here, this is uh, 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 quite a bit of, uh, of years uh, 12 plus years of work in bringing this together for some of our, our customers, uh, working with different mobile network operators to provide a global reach, as well as several of the tier one suppliers and different content providers. Um, we're finding that, uh, you know, every bearer, and bearer meaning what's the communication link, is, is required. You know, if you look at what is, why would you use Bluetooth in the vehicle when it's a short range uh, uh, a bearer service? Well, Bluetooth actually is what connects your cell phone to the head unit for voice communications, but we can also use a profile within Bluetooth to actually get content information back and forth, right? So in, you, in, in essence, using the, the phone itself as a bearer service or a pipe out to the, the cloud and bringing some of that content that you have within your phone into the vehicle itself so it can be used uh, safely. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're looking at uh, in, in transition, I would say, with several OEMs depending on the region on what other bearer services to use when it's an embedded module, whether you use LTE or, or moving on to higher uh, our bandwidth services. I really think that's depending on the business model and in some cases dependent on the, uh, the vehicle lineup. Uh, and that's an area that I want to touch on because, I, you know, if you do an audit of telematic services today on a global scale, what you're going to find is that most OEMs have an on or off service, meaning that it's either going to be this basic service or, or value-added services they're offering to their customer or it's none. There's not much differentiation by vehicle label within an OEM. 
right? I think you're starting to find that with some customers who are now in their third or fourth generation of telematic services are starting to add feature sets for certain vehicles to, uh, that other vehicles will not have or be, uh, uh, even have the ability to offer to. So there's a big, you know, for those, for those uh, OEMs that are further along, I would say, in their third or fourth generation, their, their service delivery platforms are getting a little bit, uh, are moving more sophisticated to start differentiating the services by different SKUs or levels that they can offer to their customers. And that's in, that now brings a platform for commerce versus just a safety and security platform. And that's a big area that we are currently focusing on with our customers and developing a, a value-added service ecosystem and then developing the components that are needed within our, uh, our service delivery platform, Corio, to bring those uh, services and differentiation by region uh, uh, to market with them. Um, can we go to the next slide? So one thing, you know, we, we, we look, if you look at this slide here from the left side to the right, uh, connected vehicle services uh, is your traditional safety and security, the driver assistance uh, type of package, which, is, in the, which uh, is pretty much in the market today. And, there, and frankly, there's not much differentiation there, right? Uh, you know, if you start now moving to driver experience, uh, where you start doing the smartphone integration, there's a lot of differentiation that we're starting to see with the, uh, with the car manufacturers. Uh, in particular, now you're starting to see some more, a little bit more standardization with CarPlay coming in and Google offering their service. Uh, we're starting to see several OEMs also create a, a, a third stack, I would say, so they can actually have a little bit more control on how they manage their services and how they present these services to their customers. Uh, as they see the, the head unit or the display as being one of the areas for, uh, uh, for differentiation for their vehicles, in particular, different vehicle lineups that they may have in place. But in short, what I, wanted to, what I want you to walk away from this slide is that it's not just about the driver, per se, that the OEM is trying to manage with these service delivery platforms or the architecture decisions they have to uh, make. It's, it's really, they're in the business of selling vehicles. They happen that telematics is actually now becoming, a, it will be, continue to become a standard, but it's starting to go vertical, right? So you're starting to see services they need to offer to maintain their leadership within their vehicle lineup for fleet services. And these will be line fit fleet services. Uh, they're starting to have to work with insurance companies and integrating some of those services or driver uh, uh, related applications as part of that. And, if we, and then if you look at the driver efficiency aspect of it as well, where they can actually start, if, if they bring three of these components together, they can start now getting to the point where they, at the end of a lease, they can actually tell a customer what it actually costs them to own their vehicle. And that's the end goal, right? They will love to. They will love their salespeople at the dealership to be able to say, if you buy my car at the end of 43 years or five years, it is going to cost you this much versus my competitor. Now, if the competitor does not have a way to actually justify those numbers, well, there is an area there where connectivity is actually given an OEM an advantage outside of all the other uh, uh, services or discussion points that we've actually uh, had here. So. That's, uh, I think, it, for, for me in a nutshell, look uh, forward to some of the questions and, and uh, going from there. Okay, great. Thank you, David. So the first question I have is for Andrea. You talked a lot about the openness and the security. So really, it's a two-part question. So the first part is, um, who do you believe is responsible for ensuring the end-to-end -end security? Is it um, one player in the value chain? or multiple players in the value chain. And then the second part is when we move beyond the vehicle to connect to the home or the city, um, again, does that, that value chain change from a security perspective? Do other people need to get involved? Good question, very good question. Um, I don't know if there's a universal answer on that. Um, we, in general, work with our um, OEM partners or other players we work together really as a team together, as everybody has this expertise in the area. So um, for the security inside the car, that means also securing the bus system and everything, I think the driver will expect that it's the responsibility of the car OEM. Um, obviously, therefore, he needs to ensure that every supplier and everything is that that is uh, secure to this. We can, from our point of view, talk about the security of the network and that the communication is secure. 
And then you have like the service provider like Ubiquity is obviously there must be ensured that these data are stored secure along to data um, security laws and data protection laws. So I think it's the responsibility of everybody in the whole value chain to have their own expertise um, and to contribute to that thing. Um, as, uh, as if you go out then it's even, even further. Um, especially if you talk about some life critical systems, uh, as you've mentioned, e-call or something like that, there obviously um, security is, is clear on that. Or if you go to um, autonomous driving where this is maybe influenced um, by some things, then you can happen cause really bad accidents uh, if there is an influence on that. Um, so um, it will never be only one who can deliver all the security. Um, everybody should have a solution um, supporting security which must tie into each other. Um, the one who in the end is responsible obviously if there's a contract with a customer, this contract owner with the customer needs to ensure that um, he has a secure service. We're only happy to work with all the stakeholders together and look at what could be the best solution and a good, I would say, risk um, and benefit analyst um, because if you talk about encryption, this could cause a blast of data, obviously. So, um, but it's worth for certain areas to um, invest in this security, I would say. Okay, great. And actually, Andrea, I'm going to ask you one more question that just came in from um, the listeners since it's a, a, a mobile network offer operator related question and can you spend a minute explaining um, when there is a SIM in the car and what the role of the SIM is in the car? Yeah, um, I think David, um, David uh, put in this already. I think the SIM is in the car when you want to interact with the car independent of the driver and in a secure way that you need to ensure connectivity is always um, available. So if you have everything like a remote service access, for example, like um, door opening, where is my car parked and all the things, um, then there is the need that there is an embedded SIM inside because otherwise um, it makes no sense if I need to have my phone communicating so it's not really remote then anymore, I would say. Um, on the other way, if you need really safe and reliable stuff there, where you can't, um, I would say, 100% uh, ensure that the phone connection of the driver or in inhabitant of the car are working, um, normally there is an embedded SIM inside to ensure for an emergency call, for a breakdown call, life critical systems in, in that. Um, it's more standard, I would say, in uh, maybe in US market than in Europe still, but more brands bringing it out. Um, if you talk about e vehicles, I think there will be no e uh, car or vehicle coming out which is not connected because this brings you the, the way of safety and peace, peace idea that you can check um, the battery level of your car, you can connect and re reconnect in the infrastructure to. Um, charging stations around that. Um, that is the usual case. And um, there are some other services coming maybe from insurers which normally put up then an extra box on a connectivity box inside when it has insurance telematic services where for example you have a pay as you drive service because you get a good discount um, when you lock how you're driving and that you don't um, speed too much or drive in dangerous zones with your cars or something like that. Okay. There's a need great. for having them um, SIM embedded in the car. Okay, great. Um, another question, and I, I will leave it up to um, Christoph or David, which one of you would like to take this one. Um, but Andrea just talked a little bit about the model in the U.S. related to a SIM and I think most OEMs are looking for a global provider. Do you see a role for regional carriers in the connected car space that can't provide a global SIM? And what would that role be if you do? 
Yeah, Christopher, happy happy to give my comment, but also please, uh, David, chime in afterwards. I, I think you you will all find all different sorts of of offerings that that OEM bring into the market, and obviously, often in in high end uh, vehicles, you will find sim built in, and then you know, obviously, an operator who can provide certain level of roaming. Uh, probably it's not expected if you buy a vehicle in, in, in Europe that, that it runs in, in Southern America. It's not a very likely use case. But, um, you know, so you'll find these scenarios. On the other hand, you you have to find solutions in the market where no SIM is provided and uh, maybe more the, 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 the more economic vehicles and then it is expected that customers bring their own SIM or tether their smartphone to bring connectivity. So I think we'll find all, all different kind of models, but, you know, I think clearly in in certain market being able to have a roaming compelling roaming offering and data cost and bandwidth is an issue because with a connected vehicle the, the the demand for bandwidth goes up in general particularly from our side we're talking about updating map data over the air so you always have the freshest map data in your vehicle this can be megabytes uh, hundreds of megabytes depending over the over the lifetime um so there there is a need to have a um, uh, to have an economic offering of a, of a SIM card that, that works wherever the vehicle drives. And this depends by market and by vehicle manufacturer. I, I concur with everything that was just said. Uh, I would say the, the example that I would use is depending on also the size of the OEM uh, and what services they're offering. If you look at the General Motors, a Toyota, or a Ford Motor Company where are looking at a global vehicle deployment, they would prefer to actually work with a global service provider. And then uh, look at the regional service providers to see to offset potentially uh, some of those uh, uh, service fees if they can provide better pricing. Uh, I would say that if you look at uh, uh, an OEM like Tesla who is pulling a tremendous amount of data, I think on the, every minute uh, or every five minutes, uh, they would prefer probably to work with a regional service provider to avoid uh, all the, the roaming fees that would be uh, uh, added on. So, so it really is going to depend not only on the OEM, but also the application that they may uh, uh, be using as, as part of that. It's interesting that you say that, David, because as I've talked with different mobile network operators, I've actually found that Tesla does do regional relationships. They, they, uh, they're the one that's kind of going against the flow there, so that makes sense why. Um, next question. Uh, this one, I'm going to ask this one to David, but if anyone else wants to chime in feel free, is, um, you know, are the OEMs really ready for this? The OEMs say they want to have a direct relationship with um, the driver, but the life cycle of a car is much different than the life cycle of a smartphone. So the driver's expectations for new services and interaction and functionality is very different. So do you think they're there? And if not, how long? Do you think it'll take them to get there, <laughs> or how, or don't they get there? Do they great, rely on other players? Great question, I, and I would say that actually depends on the OEM. I think if there is a uh, uh, from a luxury sports luxury brands, BMW, uh, Mercedes, and uh, Audi, and so forth, you have there is a prestige of, of that car owner to take their vehicle during a three or five year lease period or ownership period that they have the vehicle for. Uh, to the to the, the actual dealership. So I think that the, the, the OEMs, what I'm seeing is that they're interested not only in pulling, pulling the actual vehicle data, that's really one of the areas that they're all very interested in, uh, which ones are actually ready to receive that data and have the processes in place to be able to monetize it internally. I think they're all over the place right now, uh, I would say. Uh, but what I would say is that a lot of them do, they do want to actually have access to the customer, but they're not actually built that way. Right. So today, let's look at the way the OEM does this today. They started uh, the 2020 vehicles being designed and looked at and starting to get built from a, a, an engineering perspective today. And by the time it's actually launched in 2020, uh, there's a smaller team that's actually in place. And, and the only thing that they leave behind is really for warranty related items. That's the way the OEMs are built today. And then they move on to the next product and the next product. With connected services, there needs to be a separate team or, or a partner that they select to work with to actually take care of that consumer or that customer post the launch of the actual vehicle, which can be three, five, or ten years in some cases with some of these services they're looking to offer. So I would say that right now, most of the, uh, you know, if you look at General Motors, General Motors has, has created a, 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 this division called OnStar to actually make it a separate division that just looks after these consumers 
and also looks after where, what applications or services they're going to require. Ford Motor, uh, Ford has created this whole sync division to do the same, uh, a, a very different uh, approach in how they, uh, they do it. And then you, you have someone like uh, uh, Chrysler with Uconnect who has their own division, but also has partnered with Sprint Velocity in bringing those services together. Uh, so, so this really, it really depends on, on where the OEM is as part of their, uh, their, their actual service offering uh, for say if they're really ready to own, actually own the customer. I will say that every single one of them is very interested in getting the vehicle data for warranty avoidance uh, related activity and, and, and filling up the bays, the, the uh, filling up the actual uh, dealership bays for repairs and so forth, right? And I think that's that. Those are the two major drivers that I have seen from the OEMs and why they they want to have access to uh, the customers post vehicle launch. Great, Christoph or Andrea, do you have anything else to add? Uh, yes, Christoph here. Yeah, I I I, I would support uh, everything that David said. I think it it requires a little bit of shift in mentality. I mean, the past, you know, the hardware was built and the the the, the the satisfaction with the product was if the hardware was built to last and you know um, uh, customers are happy with this but very often uh, the the auto OEM had no idea how the car was being used and where and when and all these things now uh, this this market the whole behavior also about ownership of a car is is changing much more to something that is service oriented people are getting much more used to services use services in the internet on smartphones on TV and many many things so this opens opportunities and um, um, you can see that that many car OEMs, and really depends, but many car OEMs start to understand and embrace what kind of opportunity that is to increase brand loyalty, to build a closer relationship to their customers. But it's it's a change in model, it's a change a little bit in in the way how to approach. It's also changed to think about the life cycle of a vehicle and the customer. So that that's the that's the revolution, if you will, that is happening behind the scenes. Great, but it's maybe maybe I. I can shortly add also, it's, it's one thing always we experience to working in various industry. It's not only meaning changing your product to a service. This also means you have to transform your whole organization into a service company instead of a product company. And this is taking a while. Some are already very far, as David says, um, because it was their strategy or their image to do that. Um, but it takes a while. It is not just from one step to another because it's a different thinking, a different service approach, and um, we are trying to help these customers, not only car manufacturers, we're talking like to pump manufacturers or whatever in the world to be connected, and that means a lot of thinking. But I think some of the OEMs, when I'm talking to them, they're really going in direction. They know maybe nobody in the future is buying a car anymore, but they're buying access to mobility. And the car is one of the means to get mobile. You have access to mobility, it's the car, it's different types of car. If I go in a, in a big uh, IKEA house, I need a van, or if I go in a city center, I need a small Volvo, something like that. Um, if I long tour, I need a maybe a Touareg or Volkswagen or something like that. Or I need a tram, I need a plane. So I think at one point they know if they offering mobility, that could be their new sense where they want to go. But it's not one change from one day to another. That takes years. Okay, great. Um, one question. This is this is maybe a hard one. So I'll open it up to everyone. I, I know this is a hard one. Um, with all these different players in the ecosystem, how does anyone monetize that? Who who makes money and how do they make money? Well, we're still in business, so we're making money a little bit somewhere along the line. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, if, if you look at this ecosystem, I, I think from uh, – and, and sorry, panelists, I just jumped right in. Um, but if you look at this ecosystem, as I was going through my slides, I, I think, it, you know, we're right now where everyone's coming as a component, right? Telenor, here and Ubiquity are coming as components and bringing together a solution and you add everyone's price up and then the OEM prices it up with a markup and then sells it to the consumer. I think we're, we're with the stage we're in right now in making, and, and you know, to answer the question of what, who makes money, I'm not sure, frankly, that the OEM is doing this to actually make money, per se, uh, uh, on Gen 1, Gen 2, and Gen, Gen 3 today. Uh, I think they're try everyone's trying to get there to actually uh, make money either on subscriptions or other value-added services 
or make money on the data, right? That's actually being pulled from the vehicle. So I, I think right now a lot of the suppliers that are involved, uh, those that are actually more from a uh, looking at this as a component versus an entire solution or actually trying to own the, the, the OEM's customer, uh, per se, I think those suppliers are actually making money because they're following their traditional models of here's you know price cost and then it gets added into an entire solution. That model is changing. Uh, there's no doubt. I think I, I, if I see the OEMs now actually asking the suppliers to take some risk with them and, and generating some other value-added services to uh, to bring uh, either subscription revenue or or mod, uh, monetizing the data uh, as we move into more of an intelligent vehicle. Uh, related uh, a service. Christoph, Andrea, anything else? Yeah, um, you know, I believe as 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 usual when an industry disrupts, and and we have seen that before, if new technologies come in and enable new new opportunities, always a question how to make money and who who, who pays for all the new things and investments, and usually after a few years, somehow the value chain starts to to organize and it becomes clear. I think. All of the three of us, Telenor and Abiquit and us, we're as as David said, we're we're in a business we provide value at and we get paid for that value at. I think a little bit that often the question in the air, what are these disruptive business models where there's not a direct monetization but someone indirect, right? Selling of data and there are certain players in the industry who give quote unquote everything for free but monetize indirectly by, you know, uh, by advertising, referrals, selling data or other things. So I think that's a key question that and the answer is out there. But if, if you look at, in the end, how, how many industry then, then organize, in the end it is certain players bring in a key value that, that is there to last. The mobile operator brings connectivity, security, you know, reliability. We bring certain elements. Arbiquity brings certain elements. And this is, this is normally, if there is a need, then this, this will get monetized by one way or another. And the automotive OEM will make money with mobility. But I think we can all assume for, for, the, for the foreseeable near-term future and will be around the vehicle that enables uh, mobility and whether this is then you know offered as, 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 a, as a lease or as a service these are different ways to structure the business model but I think you will see that the players in the end the players need to provide certain value to, to that industry to that ecosystem otherwise they will, they will disappear and I think all of the three of us you have here uh, seem to have a compelling offering that, that you know our customers and partners are ready to pay money for. Yeah. yeah. I only can next? agree that in the end, in the end, the driver needs to have the benefit. And if he is deciding on that these features, the connectivity and the service around the connected cars are bringing, are the key differentiator of which car I'm buying. So the business model is: can I sell my car or not if I have it connected or not? So in the end, and maybe going down to that, if this is the competitive there. But um, yes, it's, it's different versions if you have mass market cars versus luxury cars, different requirements on that and this must fit. So it must be tailor, tailored really, all the suppliers must tailor the solution perfect to the needs for the end consumer. Because if you start on something connecting it because just it is connected and there's no we'll say, driver or demand by the end consumer behind that, um, that is the real worst thing to start. And a good example is Volvo, who had Volvo on call since years with, uh, I would say, the, the take rate could have been better. And then they launched the connected um, remote access to the heater. And I can tell you here in very small or cold Scandinavia, that was a blast. That, that ramped up the take rate like crazy. And now they have changes coming from other brands going to Volvo because the neighbor has it. Um, but he's not in his brand, so he's changing to Volvo now. So that is the differentiator where also definitely the benefit comes out of it. Okay, uh, Christopher, may, may, maybe one additional comment, I think, and this is something that differs a little bit from other other industry due to the long life cycle in the automotive industry, you know, providing something and make a commitment, yes, there will be a data connectivity still working, the SIM will work for the next 10 years or the life cycle of the vehicle, there will be fresh maps, there will be other services, this is also something that is of value um, that, that certainly is, is going to be paid and appreciated by customers and consumers in automotive AM. Yeah. So it's the, the commitment that is given by the different players to provide these services across a very long period of time, which is a life cycle of the vehicle.
Um, one last question, and then we're about at the end of our time. Um, and maybe Andrea, since you sort of opened this area with one of your slides, a question came in about um, the use of 2G, 3G, 4G for um, vehicle to vehicle communication. So maybe it's worth spending a minute or two on why the short range technologies are used and not the telecom technologies in vehicle to vehicle uh, communications. Well, I would say um, the, the mean is just really also, um, uh, it, it makes not really sense to go up and go down if you can direct have a relation car to car. Also make it um, short, make it, uh, I would say, direct communication between the cars um, and um, also a little bit broadcast idea around that um, so that you not, I would say, go into the, the 2G, 3G network because as you said, there are differentiation about that. Um, different cars have different um, suppliers for that connectivity, so you need then an interaction between these networks. And if you have another standard like um, short range communication, um, that makes it absolutely more sense to open it and not um, make another technology discussions around that. So I think it's, it was definitely the, the wise way to go that, and that's to use the uh, GSM or 4G uh, network around that. It makes it more complicated. Great, thank you. So I just want to give a couple of closing remarks and um, logistical types of information. A couple of questions came in about downloading the slides. We don't make the slides available uh, by themselves. What is available tomorrow is the full feature report and then also this webinar can be watched on demand. So if you are wanting to go back and look at one of the slides to get more information then you can uh, go to the on-demand webinar again tomorrow to do so. Um, our next Connected Car Series webinar and report will be available on the 15th of April and that will be focused on the whole topic of monetization of the connected car, specifically looking at the mobile network operators and the, the telecom players and how does that come together and how do they make money and what does it mean to the end user. So again, I want to thank all of our great panelists and thank everyone who joined in to listen to us today.